The Oliver House was constructed between the years of 1767 and 1769. The architect for the house was a man by the name of Simon Doggett. So my name is Christy J. Parrish, and I'm the event coordinator and ghost tour manager for the Oliver Estate. Judge Peter Oliver built this house for his son, Dr. Peter Oliver, after Dr. Peter announced that he was to be married to a lady by the name of Sally Hutchinson. Judge Oliver was overjoyed at the engagement and had this house commissioned to be their first home. It is important to our American history for us to be able to experience Oliver House because it was here that changed the course of a nation. The house was inhabited by Tories. People were called Tories because they actually followed the rules that were set forth by King George and the Sons of Liberty confiscated the property in 1774. Because of the sale of the items within this house, it gave the Sons of Liberty the money and when the shot was fired, in Lexington Concord in 1775. It was using Tory-made ammunition, fired at the British, funded by this very house's existence. This house should never be forgotten because we would not be the nation we are today if it did not exist. Samuel Adams kind of started to read some letters allowed at Faneuil Hall that were recovered from this very house. They were given to him from this house by a man named Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, was, he sat before the royal court, so he was a direct liaison for the Tories to the crown. Ben Franklin was invited to the town of Middleborough in 1773 by Judge Peter Oliver, Governor Thomas Hutchinson, and several of the other Tories in the area. They needed somebody who had the ability to go forth and try to reason with the rebels in the city of Boston. Ben Franklin had the power of persuasion. He was a very persuasive man. So when he came to the town of Middleborough, he came as a friend to the Tories. What the Tories did not understand was he was actually siding with the Sons of Liberty. And so during his time here, he was collecting intel that would further the Sons of Liberty cause. And that he took to Sam Adams, all made possible by this house. We've actually had John Adams, Abigail Adams, Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin. It's kind of a long laundry list because one of the things we forget is before the war, they all were just friends, and they grew up with each other, knew each other their whole lives until the separation that drove a nation apart. One of the most interesting thing about this house is all the people that's lived here through different layers of time. We know for a fact that the Commonwealth owned the house until 1793, then they sold it to a gentleman by the name of Thomas Weston. He was a judge and raised a large family here. One of his sons actually was attributed with writing the History of Middleborough, Volume 1, that tells all about the different events that happened in the area. After the Westons, his daughter, Bethania, married a man by the name of Earl Sproke, and the house became known for the longest time in 1834 as the Sprout House. She raised her family here with her husband. She's most pronounced in this house, in my opinion. She was born here, had her children here, lost her husband here, lost her children here, and then took her final breaths here. So this is very much a Sprout House, even to this day. After the Sprouts, another family came into the picture Henry Champion Jones. He was a teacher of Latin, and he bought this house to be a vacation home. After the Jones family, the house was purchased back by the Oliver family. Peter and Catherine Oliver out of Manhattan 
saw that it was for sale and they purchased the house back and took it back in the all of her name. It's kind of a what for because it was stripped from their family hundreds of years before. In the upstairs bedroom, we call it the Hutchinson Chamber. That's Sally Hutchinson Oliver's bedroom. There's a corner closet. This is the closet where the letters that were handed to Ben Franklin were tucked and hidden away by our father, Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Inside that closet, there's plexiglass over the original wallpaper from the 1700s. When you get up to it and you study it, you'll see that it's all hand drawn. When I first came here eight years ago, I was brought here to help with ghost tours uh, by another person, another lady. And she had said to me, this house has a lot of activity. When I stepped inside, I started to record straight away, hoping that maybe I could catch a voice from the past. And I absolutely did. I caught a man that has a British style accent saying very authoritatively, who walks there? And so that became the logo for the back of our shirts for many of the volunteers because it has meaning. Every time someone steps in, I sit back and I think, they're probably asking, who walks there? Another experience that I had was very real for me. It opened my eyes up to the possibility that they can actually manifest. There was a team that investigated for the night and I had shut all the lights off, locked the house up, set the alarm and everything, walked out to my car, looked up and I saw something flickering in the window upstairs. I thought, well, you know, I better go back up there and turn that candle off. But I made my way back into the house walked upstairs, I turned the light off. Then I made my, my way back to the top of the stairs. Standing there was a man in the doorway. I could not see what he looked like, but I know he was tall. And he stood there and he said something I'll never forget. He said, you came back. This is incredible. Yes, I did, is what I said really fast, but now it's time for me to go home. You have a good night. And I made my way back downstairs, locked up the house as fast as I could, sat in my car, and I was like, did that just happen? It really just did. Another situation that happened uh, that I'm glad I got to experience, I was in the dining room, and I was arranging the plates on the table and I felt a cold breeze come from the hallway through the door. I knew I was in the house all by myself. So I basically turned my head to look at the door and standing in the door was a tall lady with a bun in her hair. She had a white collar, a dark colored dress, very thin lady, and she was just looking straight at me. She walked into the space right in front of me looked at me, not angry or anything, just observant, and I reached my hand out to see if she would touch my hand. As I extended my hand, she disappeared. I believe that I might have possibly seen Bethany as broke. That was my gut feeling. So that might have been enough to scare most people, but to me it just fascinated me and I want to learn more about her. I was walking around with one of the town's members and he said, Chrissy, he said, let me show you something. And I thought, well, this could go one of several ways. So I was like, okay. And he said, I want to, I want to show you this on the map. And I walked to the end of the driveway with him. And he said, do you know what this is over here? And I said, a hill. And he was like, no, no. This is a burial mound. I said, a burial mound? And he was like, yeah, this is a burial mound on the other side of this rock wall. I said, at the entrance of our driveway? He said, yeah. He said, you know about the smallpox on the land? Where do you think they buried them? So during the smallpox epidemic in the 1600s, I'm frank, 
there was over 3,000 Wampanoag that actually perished in the Muddock area. At least 1,500 of them are buried at the entrance. This has been recorded. It's also in journals that is written by generals that came through the area on horseback and had to weave through the bodies that laid on the ground in different states of decomposition because they were not a strong people to bury the dead. Just to think about the land and the concentration of energy on the property to have Native Americans on this land that faced very difficult situations, I think also lends to the vulnerability of this house and builds the power of the activity that we're able to experience. I think all layers of people that have lived within this house, there's a piece of them that stays behind. And that's been the question I've been dealing with for years. Why? Then I've come to the realization is that they're home. This is where they choose to be. We're just spending time in their space, the space that makes them comfortable. So I try to be respectful during my time in the house. I try to do the right thing by them, be honest with them. And I believe doing that has helped build a wonderful relationship. It's allowed them to get comfortable with people a lot quicker than most places. And it's also allowed them to be more open about some of the hard facts that are difficult to share. And those are the beautiful moments when you break down in tears, when you feel such empathy and you realize I'm dealing with a human being here. They experience pain and struggles just like I do. It's not magic. It's just being human.